talking about Abraham, I think I believe you'll still gain something from our study today in Genesis chapter 17. Let's pray as we dig into God's word, Father in heaven. We just pray for your Holy Spirit to give us guidance and understanding as we study your word now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this is a very interesting chapter, and um, I suppose, kids, if you don't understand some of the words, you can ask your mom and dad when you get home. <laughs> We're not going to delve into what circumcision means today. So what we're going to talk about, well, we're not going to talk about the dictionary definition. So you can talk with your mom and dad about that at home. Or you can ask Auntie Tina. She's laughing. <laughs> you had to do some circumcisions, Tina? you just seen them. All right, right on. Genesis 17, 1 and 2. When Abram was 90 years old, and he's still called Abram, but we get to call him Abraham today. <laughs> when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. This is a this is not the first time that God's promised this, right? If you've read this before, if we've studied together, God has told Abram several times. So this may be the fourth time God's told Abram, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to make, multiply your numbers. From you will come many descendants. So God says, walk before me and be blameless. And it's interesting because Abram had shown a lack of faith, we talked about, by marrying his wife's servant and having a son with her. And so God's saying, Abram, be faithful. And interestingly enough, it's been about 13 years, I believe, since God, according from our, at least from what we read in Genesis, when God had last appeared to Abram. So it's been some time. Now um, his son is growing up. Um, sorry, I can't think of a son's name for some reason. Ishmael, thank you. Ishmael is growing up. Time has passed. And so, sorry, click, 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 click. Too far. Abram fell on his face. You might too, right? We might all fall on our face when we see God. Abram fell on his face. And, he's, and he, God talked with him saying, As for me, behold my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. So he's given a new name. And names in this culture are super, super important. Really important. Um, I'm not sure that we can fully understand that today because we just choose names from a baby book or whatever's cool, right? whatever fascinates us. Sometimes parents do put a lot of thought into a special name, um, but not everyone, right? And so, but in this culture, every name was very important. We were talking about Isaiah this morning and his sons. His sons had some very complex names that had some deep meanings. And so, interestingly enough, the only, because the word Abraham is so ancient, apparently scholars don't know the meaning. The only clue that we can take this word is so, such an old Hebrew word. The only clue we can take is from the passage itself, which says, for I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. So we can guess that Abraham means, means something to the effect that he will have bountiful children, plenty of children. Um, and that's what, that's, I read the commentary and that's all I could find. There was nothing, they said they don't know. They're not sure, it's an ancient word. And so again, Abram's promised. God says, I will make you the father of many nations. And so we come across this word covenant, and it's pretty small there, but you probably can't read most of that unless you get your glasses. But covenant um, between God and man is, it's, uh, it's like a, an alliance with a deeper meaning, a divine ordinance with signs or pledges. This is from Strong's Concordance. It's a very special agreement. That's not just your average, um, yeah, let, let's do that, right? Where you pound fist or shake hands. This is a serious agreement. God is pledging to Abraham, Abraham that he will do what he has said, that he will prosper him, that he'll make him a great nation. 
Genesis 17, verses 6 and 7, I've made you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you throughout their generations from, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So God's making this agreement with him. He's promising Abraham, I'm going to do this thing. And it's interesting that he says, I have made you exceedingly fruitful. <laughs> really, God? You've made me exceedingly fruitful? I'm 99. I had a child, but I had to work that out myself to make sure that I, you know, that I fulfilled the promise that you gave me, this covenant that you, you're making with me. And so, but God says, I've made you fruitful already. And Galatians 3.16 tells us this. It says, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds as to referring to man, to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. So through this covenant, and we've read about that in previous chapters, God's promising from you will come the Messiah. From you will come the Messiah. Continuing on, verses 8 and 9. I will give you and your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So again, God's affirming, I'm giving this land to you. Where is Abraham, Abraham living? He's living there in Canaan, right? He's living there. He's in a tent. He's not in a permanent house, but he is living there. And God's saying, I'm giving you this land as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God said further to Abraham, now as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants, after you throughout your generations. And by the way, as you think about God, God's promise to Abram of the land of Canaan. Well, first of all, the covenant, if, if they broke the covenant, then God would not continue, right? They wouldn't continue in the land. And I, we were studying about Isaiah, and Isaiah is warning of this. Um, we've been studying that with the adult class um, Bible study. Isaiah's warning of this and many other Old Testament prophets, and eventually the Israelites did, were taken from the land. They did get to return, and of course at Jesus' time they were still in possession, but after Jesus um, left earth, it wasn't many years before they lost possession of Israel altogether, and it's not until um, the last century that, again, Israelites gained control of this promised land. But you think about Canaan, and... The Bible alludes to another Canaan, which is heaven, right? Yeah, Canaan. So Abram's promises that, that place in, over there in the Middle East that people are fighting over today. But you think about it, it's way beyond just that. And they, were, they enjoyed that land. Today it's kind of like a desert, but it wasn't that way. According to what we read from scriptures, it was a beautiful place, right? A land flowing with milk and honey for Abram's descendants, but heaven is out of this world, and his descendants are promised Canaan. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we are also a part of that promise. So his descendants for generation after generation will receive this promise. Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, and in him you are also circumcised. This is the New Testament, right? Now, talking about Old Testament times, about Abram, Abraham, in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. It's talking about Jesus. And the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. Paul here is talking about circumcision and he's equating it to the New Testament practice. He's saying, you were circumcised, but not, not a physical circumcision, but you were baptized, buried with Christ, dying to the self, dying to flesh, raised to life, working with God, raised from the dead. And so it's beautiful to see the New Testament giving us a deeper understanding of what was happening here with Abram. 
verses 10 and 11. This is my covenant. So God's continuing now. We just took a detour for a moment to look at the New Testament and how it, it, it gives us a bigger view of this. So continue on. God's talking to Abram. He says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you will be circumcised and you will be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. <clears throat> so this is interesting. I should have put that other pa- passage after. Sorry about that. I guess I got them out of order, but God's saying, this is a covenant. You're going to circumcise all of your males and this will be a sign. This will be a sign. This will set you apart. This is a sign between you and me. This is, the, this is how you'll keep the, your part of the covenant. And I will fulfill my promise to you. Very interesting. So going back again, just a moment to Colossians 2, 11 and 12. So the circumcision made without hands, right? The original circumcision for Abraham and his descendants made with hands, but without hands, the removal of the body of flesh. Sorry, if you don't know, Tina, Tina's a PA. That's why I asked her. I'm, I apologize. If you didn't know her, you'd be like, why are you, why are you asking that, late, well, that white lady over right there? She's a phys- physician's assistant, so she's, she's in medical practice. <laughs> Sorry, Tina. <laughs> if you didn't know her, that's why I was just, I was just picking on her, because she was smiling. I could tell behind her mask. <laughs> so the circumcision made without hands. The doctor didn't need to do it. Abraham didn't need to do it. God's saying, this, this baptism that I'm giving you is, is a cutting away of the flesh. Continuing on to, with God's, so circumcision, um, this, is from, this is from the commentary. So here here's some thoughts on circumcision given to Abraham as a part of the covenant. It was destined to distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles. Oh, it did that for sure. We're circumcised, not those Gentiles, right? It was supposed to be a good thing. At Jesus' time, they, they saw themselves as better than everyone else, but it was to set them apart. And number two, to perpetuate the memory of Jehovah's covenant, to remember what God had promised to Father Abraham. Number three, to foster the cultivation of moral purity. Number four, to represent righteousness by faith. Very interesting. It was symbolic, right? Everything that God gave to the people was a symbol, and to us also, following Christ's resurrection, to symbolize something. Number four, to represent righteousness by faith. That was a symbol that God was the one doing these things, that he was the one saving them and protecting them and providing for them. And then number five, to symbolize the circumcision of the heart. So the Bible, what does that mean? The Bible talks about us having stony hearts, right? Did you ever go to the doctor for a stony heart? Heart problems, right? (laughs) My heart sometimes is going, like, what's wrong with me since, I don't know, since middle of the year. So the doctor's doing some tests. I don't know. I lost 15 pounds too. It's not good. I can't afford to lose 15 pounds. Anyway, that has nothing to do with it. But our real heart problem is not a physical heart problem. It is a state of mind, a hardness toward God, a hardness toward the things of the Holy Spirit, right? It's called a hard heart. The Bible calls it also a heart of stone. And God needs to do some work on our heart to cut away, to, to have that heart of flesh, surgery. So it's not your physical heart. The Bible talks about the heart symbolically as the seat of our emotions, right? And so God wants to do a work in us, and he wanted to do a work in Abram and his descendants to change them, to transform their hearts, to be soft toward God and toward following him. And then number five, to symbolize, uh, uh, sorry, I read that. Number six, to foreshadow the Christian rite of baptism, which we just read about, Colossians chapter 2, 11 and 12, which is the new Christian rite given by Jesus, followed by his disciples and his followers. It's beautiful. And so we don't have to be circumcised, in case you were wondering. By the way, a very interesting side note, some Pacific Islanders actually practiced circumcision. South Pacific, Polynesian, you can read about that. You can find it online. I found it in the commentary. It's like, no way, is that right? And so they have been practicing circumcision. Who knows if they, how they got that practice going? I don't know, maybe Abraham, who knows? Probably not. 
Anyway, very fascinating. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I thought you might find it fascinating. So Genesis 17, 12, and 13, and every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who's born in the house or who's brought, bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants, a servant who is born in your house or who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. God makes this very, very clear. I also read the reason why Muslims are um, doing circumcision at a later age is because when God gives circumcision here to Abram, Abraham, his son Ishmael is already like 13. And so they're practicing uh, circumcision between 8 and 13, which, <laughs> wow. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> <laughs> Better as a baby. <laughs> Poor Abram. Remember that later on that Jacob's sons tricked the city that, you know, the, the, this, um, this prince in the city had raped one of the sisters, Jacob's daughters, right? And so they said, well, they were trying to make peace. They wanted the daughter to marry the son, the people from this city there near where Jacob and his sons were children, his whole family were living. And they said, Okay, you guys be circumcised, and then we'll be one, and, you know, we'll allow our sister, Jacob's daughter, to marry your son, and, of course, it was a trick, because while they were, after they were circumcised, they were incapacitated, they were in such pain, and no, they had no um, drugs to take for pain, and so then they went in anyway, and they wiped them, Jacob's sons wiped them out. It was a trick. Anyway, the point being, that circumcision at an older age could be very, very painful, and especially without the modern, you know, nice tools that surgeons have. This was, they didn't have precise stuff. So, so a covenant sign, a token of the covenant. God has appointed signs and memorials of various significant events. So digging into the covenant just a little bit more, the Sabbath Institute is a memorial of creation. Covenant, right? God said, this is my day. Special day. You're marked, you're different. And the Israelites were different, right? They are different. Jews are different because no one else has that day. People say, well, you're going to... Someone said, I came to the church and no one was there. It was Sunday. <laughs> came to the church. It's, it's a sign. It's a covenant sign that sets people apart. The Sabbath Institute is a memorial of creation, circumcision, the Abrahamic covenant, baptism we read about of Christ's death and resurrection, and the Lord's Supper, right? Communion. Um, Catholics call it the Eucharist. It is Christ's sacrifice, a covenant, God's promise to us. Covenant signs. Genesis 17, 14, and 15, but an uncircumcised male, we're continuing on now here with the message that God's giving Abraham, but an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, I'm sorry, well, let's pause there. So it was very, God was very clear. But if you're an attorney, you know you like to find the loopholes. God said, da 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 He explained it very, 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 very clearly. I, some attorney might still try to find a loophole. God didn't provide a loophole. It was very clear. And by the way, this was not female circumcision. I know that's practiced in some parts of the world. It's really, really very tragic, very sad. This is not female circumcision. This is males. God's very clear, right? This was not God's intent. for Circumcision of female is really not circumcision truly anyway. So anyway, God was not providing for that. And Sarai, so continue on. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And Sarai, from what I read, is a princess, but Sarah is my princess, God's princess, God's, God's chosen one through whom I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Well, now, which wife is that again? In case Abraham's confused, God now is telling him, God didn't tell him before when he had only one wife, God didn't tell him it was Sarah. He, it was implicit 
God, Abraham knew that that was a promise, but now God is telling him specifically, Abraham, in case you're confused, I'm telling you, it is Sarah that is the promise. <clears throat> I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And it's interesting, God calls her by name. He says, she is the mother, she is the woman. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Now apparently commentators have some discussion over whether he laughed out of joy or he laughed because he didn't believe God. What do you think? <laughs> it seems like he was a skeptic, doesn't it? God has told him this so many times already. And so Abraham said, well, I'm 100. She's 90. Really, God? Would you have the nerve to laugh at God? Romans 4.19 says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead. This is Paul writing in the New Testament about Abraham. He said he was about 100 years old, the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So that's Paul's take on it. <laughs> And Abram says to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Ishmael? What's wrong with Ishmael, God? I provided a son for you. I fulfilled your promise to me. I figured it, I fixed it, right? Have you ever been guilty of solving things for God? Abraham, said, Abraham says, I, I solved it for you, God. Ishmael is the promise. He's the son. You know, you even promised Hagar. And God says, no, but your, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. And you shall call him his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. God had already promised that he would take care of Ishmael, that he would bless him and prosper him and multiply him. God promised that to Hagar, his mother. But he is not the promised son of Abraham. And isn't it beautiful how even though Abraham really messed up, he made such a horrible decision, God can take our bad decisions and make them into something good. Isn't that true? God can take our messes, our poor choices, our, even our rebellion against him, and if we will come back to him, he can, he can turn those into something good. We don't always know here on earth how that is. Sometimes we get the opportunity. Abraham, even though he lacked faith, he had had this child with, he, he got to see that God was going to bless him. And Ishmael had how many sons again? He had 12 sons too. <laughs> They're listed in the scriptures. God also blessed Ishmael, even though it was not his plan. But Ishmael was not the promised son. And now God says, his name will be Isaac, right? He, he gives him a name. He says his mom is going to be Sarah. It's very clear. I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting co co covenant. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes. I will make him a great nation. Isn't that beautiful? God prophesies about Ishmael. He says, I'm going to bless him too, Abraham. I love you. And even though you made a mistake, I'm going to make him a great nation. My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. What a beautiful promise. And so when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all the servants who were born in his house and all who were brought, bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's household, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the very same day as God had said to him. So Abraham was faithful, wasn't he? He did what God asked him to do. And God would fulfill his promise to Abraham. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And he laid on his bed for a month and moaned and groaned and thought he would die. 
wait, I didn't see that there. What do, do you think that my, <laughs> he was in pain for a while, what do you bet? Oh no, I'll never have children. <laughs> I'm gonna die. And Ishmael, his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And so, as I mentioned, if you'll read, Muslims also are still following this practice because Ishmael was 13. Very interesting. Not God's, not God's plan, but that's what happened. And so in the very same day, Abraham was circumcised and Ishmael, his son, all the men of his household who were born in the house were bought with money from a foreigner. All of them wanted to kill Abraham because of this thing that he had done to them. Oh, it doesn't say that there, but they might have grumbled, but thankfully <laughs> in that culture, Abraham was a patriarch and they did what he told them to do, right? <laughs> they, they did. And we live in a we still live in Micronesian a culture of some respect, right? So they did what the patriarch said. We can understand that. Uh, given the culture, they did what he told them to do, and he told them the promise. So they said, We understand, Abraham, we'll do what you've told us to do. We understand the promise. And they were all circumcised with him. And thankfully, they lived to tell about it, and they weren't attacked while they were crying from their pain. Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28, Jesus then took the cup, gave thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So you hear people talk about being under a new covenant, New Testament Christian, new covenant. Um, and in some senses, it is a new covenant, but it's really a fulfillment of the old covenant that goes back all the way to Adam and Eve who offered sacrifice. Their sons offered sacrifices. Noah offered a sacrifice. Abraham offered sacrifices all the way down until Jesus is the sacrifice, right? He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the fulfillment of the old covenant and he does provide some new symbols that are a part to, to establish this new covenant, right? It doesn't, and we, we don't have time to delve into it, but it doesn't mean that somehow the things that Abraham was required to do or Adam and Eve were required to do or Moses were, was required to do, it doesn't mean that somehow their the moral law is done away with. I better not go too far there. But anyway, Jesus is the new covenant, and he provides two things. What was the first thing that we talked about? Do you remember? Baptism, right? He provides baptism. No longer circumcised. You don't have to be circumcised to be a believer in Christ. The New Testament is very clear about that. They argued about that. They, the, the followers of the disciples after Christ went to heaven, they argued. The early church argued about whether you should be circumcised. They said, no, you don't need to be circumcised. Jesus provided baptism, and he provided his blood. The New Testament tells us the story of the communion, I'm sorry, the, the Passover meal, now made new, right? No longer a lamb, because Jesus is a lamb but still the bread, the unleavened bread, and now the grape juice being a beautiful symbol of his blood. This is, my, the blood, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins, a symbol for us today to remember the covenant that goes all the way back to creation. that was given to Abraham, given to Moses, passed down to us. And we, as we talked about before, are sons and daughters of Abraham, amen? We are a part of the covenant by faith. Some of us might have genetic ancestry, most of us don't, that would lead back to Father Abraham, but we are children of the promise. We are children of the promise by faith, believing in Jesus. We are also sons and daughters of Abraham, and a great multitude, as God promised Abraham again. Do you think Abraham will be surprised to meet you in heaven? Wow, Father Abraham. Huh? Who are you? You don't look like me. <laughs> yes, I'm your child by faith. By faith. Just as Abraham believed and it was given, credited to him as righteousness, we also 
by faith believe in Jesus and we are a part of the promise. Amen? Amen. Part of the promise. So that's, that is Genesis chapter 17. Um, some beautiful things there. Amen? Beautiful things. And we're wrapping it up. We're coming toward the end of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Abraham's life. Um, but there's still a lot more to come, right? <laughs> there's a lot more to come. Um, we're going we're gonna to finish with special music, and then we'll pray together. I didn't look to see who's doing special music. Are you doing special music today? No? Okay. <laughs>